It's the Weekly Show with David J. Maloney. This week, we look back at favorites from Season 3. So, uh, Discovery Plus has a new reality show called The Laundry Guy, in which laundry expert Patrick Richardson helps people remove stains from their clothes. Makes this little show look a whole lot more interesting, doesn't it? Uh, Tiger, the Tiger Woods documentary, premiered this past weekend on HBO. Uh, what a sad story. This incredible golfer was on top of the world when his wild secret sex life cost him his wild secret sex life. Oh, and in Indiana, an injured bald eagle is being nursed back to health. Uh, sadly, the poor bird is so helpless, it's been named an honorary Philadelphia eagle. And this week, the AMC movie theater chain reopened dozens of its cinemas in Illinois and Wisconsin. Uh, but they are taking the coronavirus precautions very seriously. To ensure their theaters get filled to less than 25% of capacity to comply with COVID restrictions, they're now only showing Nicolas Cage movies. So uh, let's see, the White House kitchen staff is supposedly struggling to adjust to the new administration. Uh, apparently, they're not accustomed to having served dinner at 4 p.m. In Syracuse, New York, a two-year-old girl somehow got stuck inside an iron claw machine. Uh, she was eventually freed, but it did take 40 bucks in tokens. And on this day in 1922, President Warren G. Harding had the first radio installed in the White House. Uh, later that day, he was the third caller and won tickets to a share concert. And lastly, a belated happy birthday to rapper Salt of Salt and Peppa, who just turned 55. Obviously, Salt is his stage name. Her real name is sodium chloride. I wonder if, from your perspective, dealing with weather so often, if you look at travel in a slightly different way than the rest of us? Like, does it become, does it become weather tourism for you when you travel? Always. Uh, if I have a conference, I will, lead, I will go out early to the conference if it's somewhere else in the country, specifically just to spend a few days doing weather photography. Uh, when I visit family, <laughs> uh, which my family scattered all around the country, they wonder, well, why is he getting up at five in the morning? It's because I want to go see the sunrise. So, yes, it is always a part of, of what I do wherever I am. And this puts that this puts you almost in that place of that character so that now maybe you have a different understanding of of them and what they go through. You know what I mean? I, I, I know I did, at least for me. That's great. Yeah, no, it's the it's I mean, everything about the cinematography um, and the nature of how information is communicated is very much meant to be from the character's perspective. So we never wanted to be sort of having a top-down approach of looking at the story. You're really like experiencing things through Little's eyes and taking in the world from her perspective. Um, and hopefully that allows you to sort of just like really give yourself to the story and be able to put yourself in that situation Physically. You've also recently been a science consultant for Marvel Studios. I, I mean, mm -hmm. what does that mean? How did that come about? And, and are you now suddenly the coolest dad ever or what? <laughs> well, I can't say a lot because uh, you sign a big NDA when you do any work with Disney. But uh, I helped uh, work them work through the scientific implications of, of uh, the ideas in a lot of the projects in Phase 4 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and – to the second point, yeah, my kids thought it was really cool. <laughs> well, um, I'd like to have an argument, please. If this is the right forum for an argument. No, you haven't paid for an argument. You've only paid for a fan mere. Argument is extra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but wait a minute. If I didn't pay, why are you arguing? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm arguing in my spare time. <laughs> um, is there anything that's kind of stuck with you through all the years, and especially now with some of your newfound celebrity? Um, absolutely. I, you know, I, I, I'm a very firm believer that less is more in a lot of ways, in more ways than one. Um, you know, I feel like in the United States, we're a very blessed country to, you know, to be where we're at. But I feel like that some of the other countries, you know, that have a lot less, in a lot of ways, they're a lot happier. You know, and I've, I've seen kids that 
grow up with nothing and they're just the happiest little, you know, happiest people that you'll ever meet. And so, you know, I try to instill that in my daughter as well as just, you know, you don't need the world, you know, to be happy, you know. And so less is more is probably what I would tell people. When you guys did stay hungry, when you when you guys were in the studio while you were doing it, did you guys have an inkling that it was that it was potentially going to like make this stamp on or, or permanent mark on music, music history kind of like it has? Well, if you were watching your contemporary artists at the same time, there seemed to be a pattern. And I kind of describe it as little jets on the runway. Every major label had a little jet, a little heavy metal jet. This is the metal jet called Motley. This is the metal jet called Rat. This is the metal jet called Whitesnake. This is a, and every two months, this little jet would take off. And it would take off with a video, and it would be a hit. So when the Rat jet took off, and we were finishing our record in California, our engineer, Jeff Workman, who had worked on Motley's albums with, with Worman, said to us, I guarantee this album will go platinum. I remember he said that in the studio. He said, I guarantee you this is a platinum record. So that was the first time that I ever heard somebody say, oh, this is a hit. And, um, and then I thought, okay, maybe we're one of those jets on the runway. You guys lived through some of the more famous and infamous moments in music and touring history. Are there any memories that stick out to you most from your touring days? The 83 on that tour was in Nuremberg, Germany, in the place where Hitler made all his speeches, in the actual field, Zeppelin field. So if you're, if you're Jewish, being in Germany in general is not the most comforting feeling. I mean, I will tell you, being Jewish... I, I, I wasn't getting the feeling I was in Germany. It was not like a warm and fuzzy place for me. But when we got to Nuremberg and we wound up driving into this field and there was where Hitler, the, where the Nuremberg rallies were held and there was the building that Hitler stood on and you're standing on stage and you're looking at this building and you realize it's 1983. So just 40 years prior, 1943, Hitler's standing right there uh, addressing the, the, the army right there because they kept the field intact and they kept the building intact except the night that, or the day we played um, they sold tickets to uh, to the local you know people and GIs from the local NATO base so there was 80,000 drunk people all hanging on that building that you've seen on every newsreel with Hitler walking out with Goebbels and you know Himmler and the whole crew of, of Nazis and that's all I know is that I've seen that newsreel a million times. So having a historical perspective, being Jewish, standing on stage about 100 feet from that building, staring at that building while, while we're playing, and then having D uh, admonish the audience during It's Only Rock and Roll, But I Like It, to put the right arm up in the air, right? So when he goes, and I like it, and you got 80,000 people going like that with their right arm in the air, and you're standing oh, on stage geez. watching it, I get chills telling that story, okay? So at some point, your brother, Harry Chapin, gets his big break. And then there was the bidding war between Atlantic and Electra. Um, mm -hmm. Is it true? Not Atlantic, uh, Columbia. Atlantic. Columbia. Was, is, is yeah, it, Columbia. Was. Now, what did the family think of all that when it was happening? It was exciting. It, you know, watching this happen. And Harry was indefatigable. You know, he, he, was, he was the one who, instead of waiting for somebody to make phone calls, you know, when he's, at, he's, he's opening for us, at the village gate, and all day long, he's saying, he calling up red companies. Hi, this is uh, Farley Higgins, and I, I want to tell you about this guy, <laughs> Harry Chapin, who's always so and so and so, so, you know, and you, can you come down and give you tickets, blah, blah, blah. And he just, because he was, he, uh, he'd been in and out of college. He'd been, uh, you know, he flunked out of Cornell twice, and he worked in the film business. He was a grown man. He was 27 years old, and he'd been working for five, six, seven years in, in the real business. Whereas Steve and I got out of school and suddenly, you know, and I, I got my TV show and uh, we were a little more like, oh, life is good. We don't have to, we can sort of float along here. Harry was like, um, and, and he and he believed in what he did. And so for us, it was like watching this uh, this shooting star. Let's talk about your, your Grammy Awards. Um, you've uh -huh. won three in 01, 02, and 04. Um, yeah, for... for Best, I happen um, to be upstairs. I wasn't going to be here. There but. you go. No. For best spoken word album for children's category. Uh, I mean, other people who've won that, I think, are like Audrey Hepburn, Patrick Stewart, Julie Andrews. In, in the family recordings, uh, 
you know, I have 13 recordings and, and they're well thought of. I mean, I had this career doing. And the reason I want these is because those three years, I was the only one in the category who was not a movie star or a television star, you know. And once it was, you know, it's Vanessa Redgrave or, uh, you know, whoever, they're narrators, you know, they're, they're actors. And I was the one, and all the people who vote, the only people who vote in that category are people who know children's stuff, and therefore they knew my music. So that's the reason I won these. I mean, I, I'm a good narrator, I'm not, but, but that's the, that was happened. Uh, the music category, the, the kids stuff, it was always won by Elmo, you know, or uh, yeah. Sesame Barney. Street. Barney. Barney. Yeah, and those yeah. kind of things. And so, which is, you know, I'm not knocking if it's great for a certain thing. So uh, I remember one year, uh, uh, Tony Bennett did a children's record. And he was, on, he was with Sony with me, too. Uh, so, and, and so I went to the Grammys, and, and I'm nominated, and Tony Bennett's nominated, and a couple other people, and Elmo. And Tony gets pissed because Elmo wins. <laughs> and we see him at the party. He says, can you believe we got beat by a dummy? <laughs> he never lost it. Yeah. You know, he'd won so many Grammys. I mean, yeah. He's got 20 Grammys, whatever. Did you, you wrote songs for Meatloaf, too, no? That was the beginning of it. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I played live for so long, and the truck eventually blew up for the last time. And uh, I was married then. My wife said, um, you know, why don't you just write songs? I'll pay the bills. Um, and that's what we did for three or four years. And I got a little publishing deal, and um, the publishers started sending the songs out, and the first kind of hook was Meatloaf. And... Uh, I recorded two or three things for him before I met him and I could mimic him pretty good. So I recorded them as he would sing. And then I met up with him, gave him, it was a cassette in those days and he loved it. And within a month I was living in Connecticut with him and his family making the new record. Part of it seems like the movie would give it the boost, but at the same point in time, the message is so very important. It's a funny thing with songs. I, I liken it to, if you've ever built a bonfire in the garden, you've got all your paper and everything, and you keep lighting matches and it just won't go. And then suddenly it catches light and poof. Now that match and that paper was that movie and the, you know, the Brat Pack being the, the darlings of the day. But, you know, that movie came and went pretty quickly. It only became a cult thing in the last yeah. few years. But uh, I can remember going to radio stations in England and they'd go, we don't know whether to put it on the playlist, but then we saw you and Tina together and we thought it was interesting. I stopped Tina getting to number one with uh, We Don't Need Another Hero, yeah. so I almost stopped again. So it became a great story, but that's how, that's how kind of uh, faint-hearted it was. That, But in America, it obviously was straight on the radio, but here we are 30-odd years later, and, uh, you know, people... People get married to it. People li live their, you know, moments in their lives. I think you've said before that you had to kind of commandeer your mom's computer to 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 do some stuff. Tell me, tell us about that. Oh yeah. So so yeah. Um, my mom had an HP computer, and um, I had found a program at the salvage store. It was like twenty dollars. So it was the last twenty dollars I had. So I bought it. I installed it. Got a keyboard and a mixer. I went to work. You know, and she fussed at it initially, so you know, I, you know, she's. I guess now, I yeah. guess she's glad that she kind of let me borrow this. So. Yeah, it's tough to fuss yeah. now with the with the with the with the Grammy sitting right there. Um, <laughs> right, right. <okay. laughs> what kind of memories stick out to you the most then? Well, uh, musically, it was uh, you know, my brother is actually turning me on to uh, David Bowie and. Uh, and glam rock. That's uh, I was a pretty classical guy, and uh, I came home one day, and David Bowie was blasting out of their out of their bedroom. So, when your parents are there and you're in a punk club, do you do you do you ramp it up? Do you tone it down? Do you change it all, or just the show must go on? Oh, the show must go on. That's that's one thing. My parents uh, my parents were pretty accepting of everything we did, so we didn't have to we didn't have to change our our attitude uh, if they were around. That was one of the cool things about them. What was that road like for you guys? We were we were in studio making our second record when the first one broke. Is basically what happened. We got yanked out of studio and put on into a tour bus, and we toured the world for two years promoting the first record. But while we were making our second record, while we had before the first record had had broke, we were 
we were stoked. We were like, in, we, you know, our records had sold. We'd sold records. We had gotten, we had made enough money to make a second one. We were in studio making a second record. It was awesome. We were, you know, we'd made it. So that for us was, you know, it was enough, you know, like, and so that when it did hit, it was, it was a, just another world. We're talking about how the, how with the internet now, anybody can, can get on and anybody can do something. Whereas before it used to be much more competitive to impress a producer. When I was starting out, um, a record company, um, uh, if you wanted to record your music, recording was expensive. So the recording studio cost a quarter of a million dollars, and a lot of people wanted access to that. There was a gatekeeper at the door of that recording studio, and the gatekeeper, sometimes it manifested as the head of a record company, sometimes it manifested as a producer, or other items, but they certainly weren't your mother. And, um, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and so... They would say, play me what you've got. I'll let you know if you can come in. And it had to meet a certain bar. What the Internet allowed is il the Internet allowed access for all. The Internet eviscerated the income stream that allowed gatekeepers to concentrate talent. Let me be as clear as a bell with you. Great art is the result of wealth concentrating talent. At some point you were signed to Capricorn Records and then Epic. What was that journey like for you to get to that point? Something happened, in my opinion, in the early 60s, multi-track recording became available. And what that did was that just blew the marketing of music wide open. Because now you could take a singer-songwriter, for example. And if you listen to old tapes of Cole Porter singing his songs, um, uh, Cole Porter just wasn't a very good uh, singer. Um, Post-1960, with multi-track recording, somebody like Cole Porter, somebody indeed like Carole King, Carol King was able to make tapestry as a result of no longer needing a world-class singer to sing her song. I'm curious if you knew Saturday Night Live was going to be using the song for the Roxbury Guy sketch. Did you know? And what did you think about it when that came up? Well, I did know because Clive Davis I introduced me to, um, to Lauren and all of the, the Saturday Night Live crew and SNL crew for today's audience. And I uh, went out with, uh, to see Bette Midler in the evening, and everyone got together. And uh, we were just joking about some, some things. And uh, we got back to speaking about the wild and crazy guys of the 1980s and uh, Steve Martin and Dan Aykroyd. And it was, it was all a joke, you know. We were just having a good laugh about it. And then three weeks later, I get a phone call that they want to use What is Love for a skit on Side Night Live. I'm... What do you say? You say, yes, 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 please. <laughs> You've spoken often about tolerance as one of the things most important to you. Do you think that your years of traveling between cultures kind of influenced that? Definitely, definitely. Um, look, um, when you come somewhere new, you can't bully the people. You can't force your way in. You have to be tolerant. You have to wait. And uh, it's, it's like our society today. Um, nothing has changed. We, we have to step back and Everyone has their perspective, everyone have their point of view, everyone have their opinion. And just because it doesn't agree with your opinion, that doesn't mean you have to shoot them. You know, you just you have to sit down and work it out. Or go on the side when no one is looking and just talk to each other. Get it done. And that's how I that's how I got through it. In the beginning I, I was a bit more forceful myself. Um, but um, I didn't get far fast. Now you've <laughs> gone on to have a great songwriting career outside of EMF and have been and, and have been writing some notable hits. Uh, a big one for Beyonce and Shakira with Beautiful Liar. How did that opportunity come about? And well, uh, when um, I should mention here, you know, Amanda Ghost. So I worked with Amanda Ghost a lot. When when uh, we parted our separate ways with EMF, um, I met Amanda and we started writing um, some songs together. 
uh, for her album. And then she met James Blunt, wrote You're Beautiful, and um, and she said short, shortly after that, she got a phone call from someone. She said to me, this, I just got a phone call from this guy, and he says he wants me to write a song for Beyonce. And, you know, and I just, I can't believe this. So, you know, will you come with me? Let's go and check this guy out. And off we went to this address in New York. We happened to be in New York. And and, uh, um, and we and it was, lo and behold, it was the Universal Building. We went to meet this guy called Tata Smith. And he's like, yeah, I want you to write a song for Beyonce. And we we're like, well, you know, Amanda sort of went, you know, well, I don't really write songs for other people. You know, I'm, I'm an artist. And I, I, uh, um, you know, and I, that, you know, the James Blunt thing was just a, was just a one off, you know, and, and he's like, well, hang, no, no, come on. There's somebody I want you to meet and in walks Beyonce and Jay-Z. And we were like, whoa. And, and Beyonce said, you know, we'd love you to, to write a song. And, and, uh, Amanda it becomes kind of tough yeah. to say no at that point. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, we share. We got a couple of stars and a neon moon pair of honky tonk cars. Friday night boots. All we're missing is the sound of a put my arms around your team. So come on, cover band. There's something we can so dance to. We're headed for the blue. But things get clear And that special place we tried to find Is somehow all oh, so near What a way to be with you Hand in hand above the clouds I got loved you quite forever Now I'm saying it right out loud What a kick to open our eyes And watch the world go drifting on Stop. We sprang from a weed in the Garden of Eden, all scattered by wind and foam. So hungry for shelter, we seek out our true love to pick up the pieces and welcome us home. And the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and Man and moon. When you're coming home, I don't know when we'll get together then, son. We're gonna have a good time then. Won't you sing a verse? Go. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, Thanks for the ball, Dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today, I got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. And he walked away, but his smile never dimmed. He said, I'm gonna be like him. Yeah, you know I'm gonna be like him. Yeah. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, I don't know when. We'll get together then, son. We're gonna have a good time then. Say 